Good morning, church. If you brought a Bible, I want you to open it to Luke's biography, the 18th chapter. There are four biographies of Jesus, four men's perspective inspired by God to tell the story of Jesus Christ at the very beginning of your New Testament. I want you to go to the third biography, Luke's biography, and we'll read in a moment in chapter 18. I think all of us around the world, without exception, have certain views about God. Individually, I think every human who's ever been alive has a certain picture, a very individualized picture and understanding of God. And whether or not those ideas are true or accurate is not relevant to most of us because we naturally want to define God ourselves. We naturally want to see God the way we understand him to be. Some of our ideas are biblical, biblically sound and others not so much. We want to believe certain things about God. For instance, we want God to be patient because we know how fallible we really are. We know how often we need a second chance, so naturally we want God to be patient. We want God to be loving because we know if we're honest with ourselves, we're often unlovable. We're not always lovable, so we want God to love us anyway. We want God to be understanding. Remember from last time, the reason for this is because according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and the wise King Solomon, God has actually imprinted on our DNA. He has created a hunger in our hearts to believe that he is out there. Intuitively, man around the world, all across the globe, throughout time, wants to believe in God because God's imprinted that on our consciousness. That's why the overwhelming majority of the world is religious. Now, since we have certain views and since we'd like to create our own understanding of God, we have to ask ourselves, how does God's patience land in our life? How does his love land in our life? How does his understanding land in our life? What I'm asking is, God is patient, but how patient is he? God is understanding, but how understanding is he? That's what Core 101 is all about. Core is about your faith walk. It's about shaping your picture of God into something that's biblical, into something that's true, into something that is beneficial to your faith walk. What are the key building blocks to faith? How do I know I'm on the right track? How should I pray? That's why we're going to talk about such things over the next several weeks, because we want you, at the end of this series, to possess a working knowledge of the key components to your faith walk. Last time we dealt with world religions and a Christian worldview. It is inaccurate, improper, it's untrue to say that all world religions are basically the same. In fact, if you just take the three major monotheistic religions in the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and you study each, you will find that they have truth, they have doctrine, they teach doctrine that is contradictory to one another. In fact, it's in direct contradiction of one another. You cannot say that all religions are basically the same. It's simply not true. This time we're going to talk about authentic faith. Authentic faith. So somebody investigates Christianity, they decide to buy in. What does the Bible say about a meaningful, eternal connection with our Creator? In fact, as you study Christianity, you're very quickly confronted with one of the distinguishing characteristics that sets Christianity apart from all other world religions, and there it is. Salvation, meeting our Creator, living eternally with God, comes by grace through faith. But what does that mean? What's that mean? Today, using two passages, I'm going to try and unpack and demonstrate exactly what authentic faith is. Remember, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way. I am the way to God. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one gets to the Father 
except through me. You know what that means? That means that your relationship with God, my relationship with God, it begins today or it began a long time ago when we accept the historical Jesus Christ as our way, as our truth, as our life. That is very different from saying, oh yeah, I believe in God. Sure. Yeah. I go to church when it's convenient, when I have something better to do, but sure, sure, sure. I'll go along with you with Jesus. I, I, I get it. Authentic faith is very different from simple mental agreement with the facts about Jesus Christ. That's what we want to talk about today. Because you see, prior to your faith commitment to Jesus Christ as your way, according to this book, you were a stranger to God. Paul even calls us objects of wrath. That means because there's nothing covering my sin, because I I don't have Jesus. He's not my way. Oh, I'm basically a good person, but I don't follow Christ. I believe in God, but I'm not a follower of Jesus. If that's my condition, then I'm part of the cultural cosmos. I'm part of the evil that surrounds the darkness of this world, and therefore I will one day be judged along with evil. Now, if you're unsure of this incredible commitment in your own life, I talk to people very often who say, well, you know, goodness, I was baptized when I was a little kid. I grew up going to church, but, you know, I kind of drifted away, and now I'm not sure what I believe. I want to ask you four very penetrating questions, and I want you to consider them. Here's number one. Am I aware of my sin nature and its consequences? Are you? Are you aware that it's much, much easier for you to do wrong than it is for you to do right? That's why it's so hard to change. Sin comes naturally to me. Sin comes naturally to everybody. No one in the audience had to teach their child, three years old, okay, honey, today, mommy's going to teach you how to lie. Today, mommy's going to teach you to take something that doesn't belong to you and call it your own. We never had to do that. Why? Because of our sin nature. But what about the consequences? You know what Romans chapter 6 And verse 23 says, it says the wages, the payment for that sin is death. Not only physical death, but eternal death, eternal separation from God. That's question number one. Here's question number two. Am I aware of God's love for me? God loves you. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you've been, Regardless of what you regret, regardless of how many times you failed, the Bible teaches God loves you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul wrote, while I was in the very action of sinning, that's when God decided to demonstrate his love for me. That's love. Here's question three. Am I aware of God's plan that involves Jesus Christ? He is the cornerstone of the plan. He's the foundation for everything. Jesus Christ is my way to God. The end of Romans 6, verse 23, remember, it begins, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here's question number four. Am I willing to trust him with my life? Am I willing to trust Jesus Christ as my way my truth, and my life. Can I make Jesus boss in my life? Can he be Lord in my life? Or is it much more convenient for me to just kind of mentally accept the truth of God so long as it doesn't inconvenience my way? Now, in our age of relativism and pluralism, it is grossly politically incorrect for me or anyone else to say, Jesus Christ is the only way to God. There are a lot of politicians in Washington who go to church on Sunday. Some of the largest churches in America are in Washington, D.C., and our congressmen and our senators, they attend these churches. But I almost guarantee you, not one of them would stand behind a microphone and say what I just said, to say what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. They would be crucified because in our cultural pluralism, our age of relativism, it really doesn't matter what you believe so long as you believe it. 
that's your truth and it works good for you, good. All roads up the mountain eventually lead to God, so simply pick one. Now, there are critics of Christianity and skeptics of Christianity. I've had conversations with many who push back at this whole idea. They call it exclusive. Mike, how arrogant must you be to say that yours is the only way to God? I didn't say it. It's not my way. I'm simply responding to an invitation that is worldwide. It's been offered to all. I accepted that invitation, and I chose it for myself. That is my Christianity. To push back on God's invitation to all, to call it exclusive rather than inclusive, let me offer you the following. Number one, let's talk about truth. Are you willing to agree that everyone chooses their perspective? They shape their own worldview. No one in this auditorium had their faith thrust upon you. You are not forced to believe what you believe. All of us need to understand without exception, we choose our truth. So what is Christianity? Christianity, biblical Christianity, biblical salvation is a choice that you make to surrender to the authority of your creator as revealed by Jesus Christ and the word of God. You see, the faith journey only begins with simple belief, but it doesn't stop there. Here's number two. Let's talk about your self-sovereignty for a moment. I find that people who push back against their, what they call the exclusivity of Christianity, it's not they only reject Christianity, they reject all other world religions in favor of their own self-made, self-governed, self-sovereign understanding of who God is, what he's about, and what truly matters. Here's what I say. It is illogical. It's even arrogant to assume that you get to define God in his way. Who are you? Who am I? To say God is like this or God is like that. The claims of Scripture are inclusive. The invitation is open to everyone. It's only the skeptic who makes them exclusive. Scripture says, hey, here's the way. I'm revealing to all. Here's the way. It's been revealed to everybody. That is inclusion. And to dismiss the Creator's plan as revealed in the Bible and trust my own cognitive faculties to figure it out for myself is arrogance of a high order. Can you imagine if this building were on fire and the lights had gone out, we could barely see the red exit signs above the doors, the room was full of smoke, and finally someone opened the door on the side and the light from outside penetrated that smoke and they shouted to everyone, come, follow me, I found the way. Can you imagine someone over here standing up and saying, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to think you are the only person who's found a way out? What would we do with a person like that? That's ridiculous. Such is the claim of the skeptic most often. Here's another reason people push back on the claims of Christianity. It's because they've looked at us and they found a hypocrite or seven. Hypocrisy. Oh, there it is. You people are no better than I am, so I don't believe what you believe. Follow me. The problem with Christianity is people, not the teaching of Jesus. The problem with Christianity is in humanity. That's where the failure lies, not biblical doctrine. Here's what that means. That means that there will be moral people, very moral people outside the church, and there will be immoral people inside the church. The problem is one not of Jesus, not of the word of God, not of the principle, not of the doctrine. It's a problem with us. Look, if you're new to this church and you think that you're surrounded by some of the finest people in the borough, I could tell you a few stories. If you're sitting here and you're brand new and you think that somehow because I'm the one on the stage doing the teaching that I'm somehow really tight with God, that I'm like perfect, man, you're crazy. I struggle like everyone else, but in the struggle lies the authenticity of my faith. You see? If you're not struggling against sin, if you're not fighting the good fight, then I would question the authenticity 
of your faith. So let's talk about that. Authentic faith. You've heard me refer to it on many occasions. Do you realize 30 years ago when we started this church, I made an important decision. I, I, I did not want to use the verbiage, the language, the terminology that I had used growing up in the church. You see, I used to say things like, you need to get saved and become a Christian. I used to say things like, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. I don't say those things in this church. Haven't for 30 years. If I do, it's a slip of the tongue. Do you know what I say? I say, you need to embrace authentic faith in Jesus Christ and make him your Lord. Make him your boss. That's how I say it. Now look, we've all been there, right? We've all stood at the end of a service and sung 17 verses of Just As I Am till we've lost our voice, and the pastor's going back and forth on the stage. There's someone here tonight who needs to come forward and make things right with God. There's someone here tonight who needs to come forward and ask Jesus Christ into their heart. And finally, someone comes forward, and what do they do? I've been the person down front helping those come forward. What do we do? Here's what you need to pray. We've got it written out on this card for you. Go ahead and pray it. Now, I want you to sign this card. Next week, we'd love to baptize you. God bless you. See you in the kingdom. That's not the way it's done at Grace Community Church. Nobody gets pushed into some kind of manufactured belief about Jesus. At Grace Community Church, I want it to be clear. The only way to God is to accept Jesus Christ as your way, your truth, and your life. You see, if you can't accept the Creator's plan as it's been revealed... And you've got one question to ask yourself. Because the Bible makes it clear. Salvation is by grace, through faith, not of works. It comes from Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. There it is. The best definition for grace I've ever heard is unmerited favor. What is grace? It's God's unmerited favor. It's God giving me something that I just don't deserve because I didn't earn it. I didn't work for it. It's unmerited favor. That's how it's different from mercy. Mercy is not getting what I do deserve. Grace is getting what I don't deserve. Paul wrote, it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. You didn't earn it not by works so that nobody can boast. So again, if you are unwilling to accept Jesus Christ as your way, if you've got a better understanding of God and push back against what you see as the exclusivity of Christianity, how would you answer this question? How good is good enough? Are you good enough? Most everybody I talk to, almost without exception, believes they're basically a good person. If I asked you, what kind of person are you? Well, I'm not perfect, but I, you know, I've got more good days than bad. I'm basically a, a good person. You see, most of us intuitively know that our creator must favor good over evil. He must. So we try and live a life where the good outweighs the bad. But I got to ask you, how good is good enough? And who gets to decide? Who determines if I'm good enough? More often than not, we try to do the right thing, but do we do it often enough? How good is good enough? Jesus has a conversation with a guy, an influential ruler in Luke chapter 18, and this ruler believed that he was good enough, and he wanted to prove something to Jesus. Look at verse 18 of Luke chapter 18. Read with me. A certain ruler asked Jesus. Now, right away, we know this is a person of influence. This guy's from the right family. This guy's educated. This pro guy probably does good. He uses his authority for good in his kingdom. A certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God. Hmm. This guy thought he was good, thought Jesus was good, thought they were two peas in a pod. Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. 
This is going to be an impossible lesson for this young, wealthy, powerful humanitarian who's used his authority, used his power, used his influence to bring good to his people. It's a tough lesson for us to accept as well. You see, because most of us, when we think about our goodness, we kind of see ourselves on a scale, right? And on the evil side, I'm sorry to look at you when I say that, David. On the evil side is Adolf Hitler, right? Well, I'm no Adolf Hitler. On the other side, however, is Mother Teresa. And we would have to say, I'm no Mother Teresa either. So I'm somewhere in between Hitler and Mother Teresa. I'd like to think, well, I'm sure I'm nowhere near Hitler, but, but I'm closer to Mother Teresa. What Jesus is saying is that's still not good enough. Because God, the righteous, holy creator, doesn't play by those rules. He doesn't even play in that ballpark. He's on a totally different scale. God is so good, he makes Mother Teresa look like Adolf Hitler. Hmm. How good is good enough? It's a trick question. How good is good enough? You can't answer it. You see, here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches very simply that I am unlike God. We can all go along with that, right? I'm unlike God. Since I'm unlike God, I'm ungodlike. That makes me ungodly. There is no one good but God alone. Watch this. You know the commandments, don't you? You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And then it's like the guy interrupts him. Because Jesus could have gone on and on and on. At this time, there were more than 600 commandments. Jesus could have spent the whole afternoon saying, you know this commandment, you know that commandment. And this guy probably would have said, sure. Look, he interrupts. All these I've kept since I was a boy. That's like saying, I'm basically a good person. I'm better than most. Watch this. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Uh-oh. What does he lack? He didn't understand that he couldn't accomplish what God requires on his own. This young man could pile up all his good deeds into one big pile, and Jesus could still point to something that was out of line. Look, I'm not here to toot my own horn, but I've been a minister for over 30 years. I've been a part of the church since I was born. I have attended, served, worked in, or pastored churches all my life. I could pile up a pretty good pile of good stuff. I've led mission trips. Believe me, I know what camp tired feels like, right? I've given. I've tithed all my life. I've tried to lead people in the right direction. I could pile up a pretty good, substantial pile, but Jesus could still tap me on the shoulder and say, Mike, you missed something. You see, that is the definition of human depravity. Because I am not like God, I am ungodlike, I'm ungodly, there's no possible way for me to hit the mark. Because Jesus can always point out something we've missed. Look what he points out. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now don't misunderstand. This is not how we get to God. Jesus is not saying the way to God is to sell all your stuff and give it to the poor. Then you're going to go to heaven. That's not what's being taught here. What's being taught here is that you're not as righteous as you think. You're not as good as you have to be to meet the holy requirement of God. That's what's being taught. It's a lesson in surrender is what it is. Let's see if he surrenders. Verse 23, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus pointed out the one thing that he just couldn't do. Again, it's an example of self-sovereignty over submission. You see, this rich young ruler had personally homemade his own understanding of righteousness. He believed he was good enough. Jesus pointed out his error, and he went away because he couldn't surrender. He'd done good work. He considered himself closer to Mother Teresa than Adolf Hitler, 
But what he didn't understand is that the way to God is through Jesus Christ, not his good deeds. Now, when we turn to James chapter 2, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, James the Apostle, seems to contradict that message. According to verse 1 of chapter 1, James is writing to Jews who've embraced faith in Jesus. Follow me. They've left behind their rule-oriented, legalistic-oriented Judaism, and they've clung to faith in Jesus Christ. But what it led some of them to do was to exchange the law-abiding for newly found freedom, and they got to the point where true, authentic faith didn't matter anymore because if I'm free, I can do whatever I want. If salvation is truly by grace through faith, as long as I say I believe I'm in good shape, I can live any way I want. James says, "Uh uh-uh, that's not authentic faith. It's the theme of James. Those who have found the way, walk in it. That's the theme of the entire book. Those who have truly found the way, the truth in the life, and surrender to it, they walk it out. They live it. That becomes their driving intention. Oh, they're not perfect any more than you and me, but that's their intention. They may stumble around a little bit, but their guide is Jesus Christ as their way. The entire Christian movement, however, is built upon salvation by grace plus nothing, or through faith, but plus nothing and minus nothing. That was the blazing brand of Martin Luther in the Reformation. Martin Luther used the writings of Paul in the book of Romans to teach that salvation is a gift from God. Again, remember Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. It is by grace you are saved through faith, not of works. 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. He has saved us all, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. Now, at first glance, reading James chapter 2, James seems to contradict that message. Follow me beginning in verse 14. James writes, what's good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? You see that phrase? It's very important. It governs the remaining 13 verses of the chapter. It explains James' purpose, his goal. We're not talking about someone who truly possesses authentic faith in Jesus Christ as their way. We're talking about someone who claims to have faith. What good is it? Can such faith save them? Now, don't misunderstand. James is not discounting the importance of faith. What James is opposing here is mere intellectual assent or agreement with God. Yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I'll go along with you about Jesus. I'll even come to church from time to time so long as it's convenient. That's what James is opposing. Someone who claims to have faith. What they have is a mere mental acquiescence, a mere mental assent. Okay, I'll go along with it. Is that the kind of faith that truly saves? James would answer no, because it's dead faith. It's certainly not authentic faith. Verse 15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, that's what a religious person would say, right? Somebody knocks on your door, hey, Godspeed, man, I really can't help you now. Maybe here's the number to Pastor Mike, give him a call, maybe he can help you. Here's the church number. Uh, I know some, I, I can't really help you now, I don't have time, don't have the resources, but Godspeed, we'll be praying for you. What good is it? In the same way, verse 17, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead faith. It's mental agreement. That's all it is. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Remember, they were Jews. They were used to keeping the law and making the sacrifice and certain ceremonial observances. Well, you can talk about faith, but I have deeds. I'm a good person. Watch how James responds. Will you show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. It is impossible to display your faith without deeds that point to the authenticity of that faith. Look, follow me here. Nothing has changed. It's all the same. 5,000 years ago, people got to God the same way we get to God today. I guarantee you that Noah... 
never walked an aisle at the end of the service, prayed a prayer that was written out on a card, signed his name to the bottom of it, got baptized the next week. Noah didn't do that. You know what Noah did? Noah, follow me, embraced authentic faith, which means he acted on his belief, and he responded to the revelation at his disposal. That's how we've always come to God. Think about Noah for a moment. Noah believed that God spoke to him and told him to build a ship. So Noah responded to that belief. He acted on that belief and spent the next 100 years building the ark. That, my friend, is authentic faith. That, my friend, is saving faith. Consider Abram. We know him as Abraham. God changed his name. Abram believed that God called him, chose him, spoke to him, he would become the father of a great nation. So Abram could not remain in his hometown of Ur or Haran if he had to go be the father of a great nation in Canaan. He acted, he picked up and moved. Paul says in Romans, that's what made him righteous. How about Moses? Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep in the desert. Moses had left Egypt behind. He was newly married And in Exodus chapter 2, Moses believed God spoke to him from the burning bush. Moses could not remain in the company of his in-laws, tending sheep, and go and see Pharaoh and demand his people be let go at the same time. He had to act on what he believed. Think about David. When David was just a teenager, God's prophet Samuel anointed him the next king of Israel. And then David spent three years running in the wilderness, hiding from King Saul, who was jealous and wanted to kill him. Why? Because David believed God had promised through the prophet Samuel that he would be the next king, and so he had to stay alive. He was acting on the revelation at his disposal. Jonah. Jonah had to leave his hometown. Jonah had to overcome extreme prejudice against the Ninevites to become their evangelist. How about the disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John? They left behind their fishing businesses. They turned them over to a relative. They left them in someone else's hands in order to act on the belief that there was something special about Jesus Christ. And so they followed. And then Saul. We know him as Paul. In Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus, Saul believed he saw Jesus, he heard from Jesus, and then Paul became the most influential person in the history of the New Testament church, especially in the first century, second only to Jesus Christ. You see, we've always come to God the same way. Your revelation and my revelation is this book and the historical Jesus Christ. The simple question is, have you responded to it? Because it is only in the response that authentic faith materializes. The action that follows the faith is proof that the faith is genuine. In James chapter 2, he's describing a faith that's authenticated. It is validated by our actions. Look, very quickly, in one minute, I'll quit. Number one, clarification. Is it by faith or behavior? From this record, James chapter 2. We know that it's not by mere belief. Had we kept reading in James 2, verse 19, James says, you believe in God? Good, so do the demons. Like, good for you. Belief is one thing, authentic faith is another. We also know from the passage that it's not about good deeds. How many times do I have to repeat Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? It's by grace that we're saved. Hey, this one will trick you. It's not even by belief and good deeds. It's not even, we don't get to God, we're not saved, if that terminology resonates with you, by believing something and then combining it with keeping the law or doing the good thing. The entire book of Galatians was written by Paul to combat that erroneous idea. So how do we get to God? Only by authentic faith, the kind of faith that's accompanied by action that James describes in chapter 2. One last question. What kind of faith is authentic? According to the passage, it's involved faith. You see a need, you try to help. It's faith in partnership. It's faith that moves you to action. 
It's visible faith. James said, you try to tell me about your belief. I will show you my faith. I'll make it visible by what I do. It's heartfelt faith, meaning it's real, it's sincere. It's sacrificial faith. The latter part of the chapter, he gives the example of Abraham offering his son Isaac, making sacrifice, and that's what counted him righteous. Look, many of you know that I have a 155-pound dog at home. Yesterday, the neighbor dog had trapped the chicken that runs our, we got a rooster that kind of runs around our neighborhood. He had trapped that chicken by the fence in the bushes, and when that dog pulled his head out of the bushes, he had a mouthful of feathers. And so I ran across the yard, clapping my hands. No, 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 I said, trying to get that dog off that chicken. Well, when Roxy heard me respond like that, I mean, I mean, she started snarling and spitting, and I mean, she took off after that dog. I thought, wow, what a watchdog I've got. Look, you don't have to have a dog like Roxy to have a sign on your fence that says, beware of the dog. You don't have to have a dog like mine. You could have a little bee dog and still put the fence. You don't even have to have a dog. You can still put the sign up. But you see, after a while, when people get to know you, and they watch how you operate, they're going to understand it's an empty threat. James chapter 2 seeks to make Christianity, saving faith, more than an empty threat. So, I leave you with the question, are you ready to embrace authentic faith in Jesus Christ? If you're here today, And like so many others, you were baptized in the second grade, but it really didn't mean much to you. And you'd like to have that dialogue. That's why we're here. Grab us after the service. Tyler, myself, Paulette, Chad, the drummer. All of us would be glad to have a conversation with you. If not, at least use the communication card and give us your name and your number. Say, call me and someone will. All right. After I pray, let me remind you, those of you with kids... Make sure you grab them and take them to the new kids' gym. We'd love to, to, for you to write your name, write a Bible verse, maybe a prayer for our kids as I did this week. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, it is a privilege and an honor to passionately try and demonstrate what it really takes to know you, to meet you, to live with you for eternity. Father, may we all examine our faith and may we make that transition from simple belief to authentic faith. I pray it because Jesus Christ is my Lord. He is boss in this church, and we want to follow him. Amen. God bless you, Grace Community Church. I'll see you next time. Have a great week.